Welcome to Organizing for Survival, Disability Advocacy During Russia's War Against Ukraine from Refugees to Veterans. This event is hosted by the Center for Global Disability Studies and the Petro Yatchik Program for the Study of Ukraine at the University of Toronto. My name is Cassandra Hartley. I'm your host and moderator for today's event. I'm the director of the Center for Global Disability Studies as well as an assistant professor affiliated with the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, or CIRIS, which houses the program for the study of Ukraine. I use she, her, or they, them pronouns. I'm talking to you today from, our, from my home office in Toronto, and I appear as a white person with my brown hair pinned back and a brown uh, shirt jacket, uh, suit jacket. So I'm very glad to introduce today's event, uh, but first I'll share some accessibility details. Our panelists will be presenting in English, but we also have additional options. We have ASL interpretation. Our interpreters today are Ryan and Shelley, and we'll be spotlighting them on the screen throughout this presentation. We also have Ukrainian language interpreters. Our Ukrainian interpreters today are Yana and Anastasia. To access the simultaneous audio translation in Ukrainian, uh, you can follow the instructions on the screen uh, slide that's posted now. And uh, my colleague Hannah will now share the instructions in the Ukrainian language. Доброго дня, шановні учасники і учасниці. Якщо вам потрібно включити переклад українською мовою, то виберіть, будь ласка, на панелі внизу переклад. Це значок глобусу. Якщо ви з телефону, то це три крапки. І, власне, там внизу Ви можете побачити інструкцію у вас зараз на слайді. Ви обираєте українську мову і ви маєте вимкнути оригінальну доріжку Mute Original і слухати лише переклад. Дякую. That's all. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, so if you're listening in English, we'll be speaking in English throughout, so you don't need to select interpretation. Uh, we also have the event outline available as an access document by request. Uh, please enter a question if you would like to receive that. And the roundtable speakers will um, be speaking freely and not speaking from a script. So please follow the ASL or captioning uh, if that's supportive for you. If you need assistance at any point in the presentation, you can submit a question through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, um, or you can send us an email in uh, the email address cgdds.utsc at utoronto.ca, and our colleagues are monitoring that account. And our event will also be recorded and posted to the CIRA's YouTube platform sorry, when the video Cassandra, is ready. I just need the email address again. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, CGDS period UTSC at utoronto.ca. Thank you for that clarification. Right. So if you wish to find the YouTube post of this event in the future, you can find it on the series channel, uh, and we'll also put that in the chat now. And as a gentle reminder to myself and our panelists, particularly because we have ASL today, we're going to speak slowly, and we'll also provide access in all the ways that we can uh, to make this a welcoming space. That includes offering visual description where appropriate, uh, and reading comments and questions in full as they're entered. If these disability studies uh, and disability access practices are new to you, uh, please join us in moving together in what we call CRIP time. So now to the details of today's event. The Patro Yachek Program for the Study of Ukraine promotes a scholarly understanding of the government, economy, and society 
of contemporary Ukraine, as well as the country's history and culture. Established in 2001, the program is housed in Cirrus at the Monk School at the University of Toronto. The Center for Global Disability Studies is a research center established in 2020, housed at the University of Toronto, Scarborough. CGDS serves as a catalyst to bring together faculty members, graduate students, postdoctoral researchers, and others conducting anti-ableist, intersectional, and interdisciplinary social science and humanities disability studies research from across all three campuses of the University of Toronto and the broader community. I'll now read a land acknowledgement, as is our practice. We open this meeting by acknowledging the ongoing colonization of the land on which the hosting institution, the University of Toronto operates, the homelands of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the credit. Our panelists and audience may be located elsewhere. We pause to consider the violence of ongoing and past colonization of this and other lands, including the homelands of some of us gathered today. We reassert the entwined nature of ableist, racist, and imperialist systems of oppression and extraction and the ongoing debilitating effects of these systems. And we proceed with these living injustices present in mind. The goal of our discussion today is to bring together disability activism researchers with new and on the ground knowledge of the impacts of war and disability on disability advocacy and policy and on disabled peoples and their families in Ukraine. Drawing on their expertise, we hope to learn more about what is happening with disability advocacy during wartime in Ukraine and as the refugee crisis continues in neighboring Poland. Our panelists include Dr. Magda Sharota, Department of Sociology, Lancaster University, researcher and expert in human rights advocacy, who's researching and responding to disability refugee crises caused by the Russian invasion to Ukraine. We have Hannah Zaremba, Department of Social Anthropology, Ethnology Institute of Ukraine. Hannah is a researcher studying Ukrainian disability activism in the contents of the 2022 invasion. Ivan Schmatko is with us from the Department of Sociology at the University of Alberta. Ivan is a researcher conducting a project on experiences of wounded Ukrainian soldiers as part of the veteran human rights organization, Princip. Audience members, as you listen, you can feel free to enter questions in the chat and we'll have ample time for questions at the end of this session. So now that we have introduced our panelists, we can actually begin our conversation. I'm so happy to have all three of you here today and very eager to find out about the situation on the ground and the important activism that you and your research participants are doing. So the first question, what are the lived experiences of living with or acquiring disability in Ukraine or fleeing from Ukraine in wartime like? What's going on on the ground right now? I'll go first um, to Hannah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, firstly, I will describe myself. Uh, I'm a woman. I'm 33 years old. Um, I have blonde square hair and I wear um, a pink sweater and round glasses. Uh, 
And now uh, I'm sitting in my apartment in Lviv. Uh, it's the city in the west part of Ukraine. And behind me is white and brown wall. Uh, actually, uh, in addition to my academic position, I'm a civil activist uh, for the rights of people with disabilities in Ukraine. I'm a head of the direction strength strengthening of community in the organization of people with disabilities fight for rights uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and when we talk about the experiences of people with disabilities after the full-scale Russian invasion, uh, I will talk a little, little bit about my research work uh, in the academy and in the uh, OPD Fight for Right. Uh, after the uh, war broke out, I was involved in the evacuation of people with disabilities from Lviv to the uh, Ukrainian-Polish border, and also I looked for accessible shelters for people with disabilities in Lviv and Lviv region. At the time, as a researcher, um, I had started to, uh, to write, to collect my diaries about my volunteering experiences and also experiences of people which I helped to rescue. Uh, and um, I have started to discuss with my colleagues how to collect testimonies uh, about the daily uh, lives of people with disabilities during the war. Uh, and a big question for us was how to do it methodologically and ethically correctly. Uh, at the time, uh, other, other colleagues who um, had started some oral histories projects uh, about the full scale invasion help us to uh, to make a really correctly methodology and in the mid of the may 2022 uh, i have started to collect interviews with people with disabilities about their experiences during the war uh, and um, I have collected uh, 26 interviews with people with different types of disabilities and different experiences exactly who left their homes. Uh, they become IDPs or refugees or uh, who uh, stayed uh, at their homes, residents, cities uh, or uh, towns. Uh, and um, uh, the big... Uh, <clears throat> And the big thing that I see and my colleagues see um, during the collection of interviews is that people with disabilities during the war actually have diff different types of experiences at the same time. Uh, yes, they are um, victims uh, of the obstacles. Uh, they are rescue themselves and they are rescue others people. And they uh, are an uh, active participants of the war uh, and when we talk about the first type of uh, experiences like uh, victims um, we understand that uh, in Ukraine a lot of architectural barriers social barriers institutional barriers inaccessible information especially people with hearing disabilities talked about this and people with intellectual disabilities uh, didn't have any information in easy language. Um, but uh, also uh, one of my uh, narrators uh, who uh, stayed and still uh, staying in Mykolaiv is a south uh, is is city in the south of Ukraine, and uh, he is uh, he uses wheelchair. Told me that uh, it's the first days uh, of the full scale invasion. Uh, he was just close. Uh, in uh, his apartment, and uh, now I was. Uh, I want to quote him. Uh, my rented apartment uh, is one of the fourth floor. After the uh, elevators were turned off, my neighbor had to use my uh, his physical abilities directly uh, to get me down. And what to do next? Because um, it was uh, really. Uh, any options to find uh, accessible shelters, 
uh, in Ukraine and um, I, I will talk more about this now. Um, my colleagues and me in Pipe for Right monitoring shelters and uh, uh, temporarily um, residents for IDPs in Ukraine and all of them are unaccessible for people with disabilities. Um, uh, when we talk about uh, another experiences uh, of uh, rescuing themselves, um, uh, I will send the link to the uh, platform of WordPress. Uh, I'm a co-author of uh, this project and also researchers uh, of this project. Um, and you can uh, find uh, 15 histories uh, of people with disabilities uh, about their um, rescue uh, ways uh, from uh, the war uh, and uh, this um, uh, this histories include quotes from the interviews and also photos which were provided by uh, by narrators uh, and very important thing uh, when we talk about uh, rescuing um, uh, that um, um, establish mechanism uh, of rescuing people with disabilities uh, during uh, conflicts or natural disasters uh, and other um, crisis situation uh, due to the efforts of international organizations, civil sectors and scientific uh, community. Uh, therefore, the safety of people uh, in particular the process of evacuation from closed institutions like boarding schools or psychoneurological boarding uh, schools, etc., must be provided by national uh, authorities and local administrator, uh, administration should uh, perform organize, uh, organized evacuation of people with disabilities from such facilities. But in practice, after the full-scale invasion, when the um, uh, it's turned out to state uh, uh, and international organization were not ready to quickly respond to needs of people with disabilities, uh, exactly who lived in the closed institution. Uh, and uh, um, for the individual evacuation of people with disabilities, saving lives uh, has become an uh, exclusive personal problem. And you uh, you will see it in uh, the stories from Vorpes, exactly. Uh, people with disabilities lead in the process of themselves or their loved ones, um, or their own connections, so social connections, social capital, uh, and not to state assistance. Um, and uh, uh, I want to add a little bit about the experiences of active uh, participant of the war. Um, when, talk, when we talk about war or some uh, natural, uh, natural disasters, uh, people with disabilities are rarely represented um, as activists. Uh, the concept of activism and involvement of people with disabilities during uh, the war appeared under the influence uh, to use the human rights model of disability. And my narrators um, have become more uh, active in various fields. Uh, most of them engage in volunteering activities. They sorted and delivered the humanitarian aid. Uh, engage in evacuation of people, prepared food, uh, found necessary contacts and things, donated to armed forces of Ukraine. And what I want to add in my organization, Fight for Rights, the half uh, of activists, activists uh, have uh, disabilities too, and they help other people with disabilities. Uh, also, uh, others began to use their professional knowledge and skills to help others. One of the narrators uh, created an informational uh, channel in the Telegram, in the social media, uh, which is very popular in Ukraine. Other um, uh, uh, gathering lawyers and provide legal advices for people with disabilities. Uh, and... Um, 
I pay particular attention uh, to the lives of people with intellectual disabilities during the war because I'm interested in intellectual disability studies. And uh, for example, civil organization that provide um, daycare for adults with intellectual disabilities uh, uh, have reorganized their daily programs um, and they are engaged uh, people with disabilities uh, to volunteering work. Uh, they viewing uh, camouflage uh, nets. They making uh, candles for tranches. Uh, and um, one of my uh, narrator uh, sharing the experiences of his best friend who uh, joined uh, the. Ukrainian army after the full-scale invasion, and I want to quote uh, my narrator. Uh, Many para-athletes are currently fighting in the armed forces of Ukraine mm, at the front. Um, less than a year ago, my friend with a um, disability from Dnipro, Dnipro is the city near the front line, uh, went to the front. And uh, this despite the fact uh, that his leg is uh, amputated and he walks uh, on the prothesis. But even his uh, brothers, uh, it's like in Ukrainian, it's pobratrime, it's brothers, it's with whom you are served in the army. Uh, found out about it only a month later. Uh, now he works as a driver in the hot spots. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Hannah. Such a wonderful, comprehensive uh, overview of how Fight for Right and the many people are responding to the full-scale invasion and have been since that time. Um, let's now go uh, to Magna Sharota to hear about how activists in Poland received refugees, and then we will go after that to hear from Ivan uh, about his experience researching with Ukrainian soldiers um, who've been injured. So first now to Magda, and then we'll have time for more rounds from each of our speakers. Magda, please share with us what's been going on on the ground in Poland. Thank you. Um, hello, uh, hello, everybody. Um, as for the description, um, first, uh, uh, let me say that I appear as a white woman uh, wearing glasses uh, with short, curly, uh, blondish hair. And I'm uh, talking to you right now from freshly post-election Poland. Uh, so you might have heard there was a great uh, milestone happening uh, in Poland politically. Um, and as for our uh, today's meeting, um, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for the idea of this uh, important panel and for the invitation. And I'm also grateful um, to the co-panelists uh, for their um, amazing academic and advocacy work. Uh, so uh, I would like to stress in the beginning that in addition to addressing uh, Russia's war against Ukraine as an urgent matter to be tackled by uh, engaged scholars and human rights advocates, um, I also frame it as an important case study uh, for a broader analysis um, of the relationship between wars, disability, gender, age, ethnicity, but also human rights and um, humanitarian discourses. Uh, and to address your question, Cassandra, what are the lived experiences of living with uh, or acquiring a, a disability in Ukraine from a perspective um, uh, of a Polish-based academic um, and activist, um, I would like to firstly stress a couple of points which are uh, which have been important in our work. Um, and some of them might seem obvious to you, but I still would like to uh, stress them. So uh, the first point is that we should never forget um, that Russia's war in Ukraine has caused the largest uh, humanitarian crisis in Europe. Uh, since World War II. Uh, secondly, um, the, this war can be characterized as one of the oldest wars in, wor uh, in the world um, because um, over 25% of uh, Ukrainians are 60 years uh, old or older. So there's a strong intersection be uh, uh, 
between age and disability, as you may imagine. And thirdly, um, the population of disabled people uh, who have been affected by this war uh, has been considerable in terms of numbers. And just to give you a recent um, statistics, um, in September of this year, um, Ukraine's uh, Minister of Social Policy um, stated that over the course um, of the 18 months of the war, uh, the population of people with disabilities um, increased from 2.7 million to 3 million. And of course, uh, due to the direct and indirect impacts of the war, it is anticipated that there will be an increase in the number of uh, people with disabilities uh, still living in, in Ukraine, but also um, among those who have fled uh, Ukraine. Uh, and uh, now I would like to focus on a specific aspect of the war reality, that is the evacuations, uh, because uh, that was my and my fellow Polish uh, academics and advocates a sort of a entry point um, uh, to the topic of war. Uh, and I will say a, a bit more ab uh, about those experiences from our perspective. Um, so, um, you know, before uh, February uh, 24th last year, um, our primary focus uh, was on disability discrimination in states and societies not torn by, by war. So that was our immediate uh, academic and ad advocacy reality. Um, however, that, ha that has changed. And since February, uh, we've ventured into a new uh, territory in a way. And we gained uh, firsthand insights uh, into the gaps, um, lack of know-how um, regarding humanitarian responses for people with disabilities um, during um, wartime. So uh, in essence, uh, we witnessed um, up close um, that many influ influential humanitarian organizations um, and sadly many transnational human rights um, institutions uh, have systematically uh, left people with disabilities behind. Uh, in their uh, emergency response plans for Ukraine. And that was a huge shock for us. Um, on the flip side, um, emergency and spontaneous support networks uh, for people with disabilities were often uh, created by people with disabilities themselves in Ukraine, as, as Hannah already um, mentioned, and also by people with disabilities beyond Ukraine, for instance, in Poland. Uh, and those networks uh, bridged uh, the gaps, uh, the humanitarian gaps that I mentioned, uh, with very minimal resources. Um, we often lacked um, prior experience in humanitarian uh, management, um, and all the while contending with our own limitations um, posed by our you know, impairments or, or chronic illnesses. Uh, so we've been engaging in what I later would call, um, it's sarc sarcastically, <clears throat> DIY evacuations. So do it yourself evacuations uh, because we've become impromptu specialists in um, uh, in organizing evacu evacuations from the war zone. Uh, and as I mentioned um, already, uh, there are a couple of million um, people with disabilities um, living in Ukraine. And as you may imagine, uh, many of them um, had specific transportation and medical needs. Uh, so therefore when um, some of them were evacuated, they needed uh, to be transported, for instance, lying down um, or to have access to um, constant medical support, um, such as dialysis or heart and um, epilepsy treatment. Um, 
unfortunately, uh, many of those people were um, even unable to make it to their train stations in Kharkiv or Kiev. And um, even if some of them were fortunate enough, uh, for instance, to be carried by a group of people to the train, uh, there were slim chances uh, they could survive a multi-day journey in a cramped train. Um, and there were also other challenges um, such as um, architectural inaccessibility, which is uh, of course uh, not unique uh, to U Ukraine. Uh, it, it's a, glo a global problem, but um, pre-war inaccessibility meant that in the war period, uh, even you know, the simplest logistics like uh, descending to basements or shelters uh, became a significant challenge. Uh, and it was often the case that disabled uh, person, um, for instance, had no choice uh, but to stay in an apartment uh, that could have been bombed um, while their family sought refuge uh, in a shelter, uh, fearing for their relative's life um, upstairs. Um, and there were also additional challenges, um, including further limiting the mobility of wheelchair users, uh, for instance, uh, due to rapid evacuations outside the city. Uh, wheelchairs were often um, left behind um, as makeshift evacuations vehicles had limited space. Uh, so uh, this led to uh, often to a dilemma of choosing between carrying another person to safety or leaving a wheelchair behind. Um, it's worth mentioning that we also encountered um, a lot of um, procedural issues uh, while, uh, while supporting disabled refugees. Um, some of them lack the necessary medical documentation, um, which could pose a problem when crossing the, bo the border. And evacuations uh, from uh, war zones are also deeply gendered. Uh, so, however, when disability intersects with, with gender, um, there are also um, specific consequences uh, that are often overlooked um, in humanitarian agendas. Uh, and they concern both um, disabled women and men or non-binary people. For instance, many disabled men uh, including those who are deaf, uh, struggled to leave the country uh, as were, um, because they were detained due to wide, uh, widespread uh, conscri conscription. And furthermore, um, small networks uh, like ours um, simply lacked uh, financial resources uh, and also distribution channels uh, to properly deliver especially um, heavy equipment mm -hmm such as uh, respiratory support uh, apparatus or electric uh, wheelchairs. And um, that created often a paradox uh, where even though we were able to obtain such expensive equipment outside of Ukraine, uh, due to not being an established wealthy humanitarian organi organizations, uh, we often found ourselves uh, stuck with the equipment outside of Ukraine. It is crucial to note that um, while uh, evacuating individuals living outside of the so-called institutions um, that offered some chances, uh, but we could do almost nothing um, aside from raising awareness in the media for the tens of thousands of people trapped um, in hospitals um, and residential homes. Uh, but once the lives uh, were saved, um, another chapter unfolded. Mm, huge questions. How can we best assist uh, the refugees in organizing their lives in new countries like you know, Poland, Germany, Denmark, the, uh, the Netherlands, etc. cetera. Mm, and um, people with disabilities uh, from Ukraine are still are in dire needs of funds. Um, accessible transportation and accommodation, as well as medical and psychological support um, due to war trauma. 
Thank you, Magda. That's really important. And we'll circle back to hear more from you about what's needed now. Um, let's go now to Ivan Shmatko, who will share his experience and research uh, with Ukrainian soldiers. Thank you. Um, and hello, everyone. So first of all, I will just say a few words to describe myself. Uh, I'm speaking from my living room in Kiev. I'm a 35 years uh, old a little bit tired man with a brown hair in a black hoodie. Um, um, I work uh, at the organization that is called Princip, the principal in English. Uh, it is uh, officially called uh, the um, Soldiers Human Rights Organization Princip. Uh, so the organization is created, as it is quite obvious from the name, um, to fight for the rights of the soldiers and the veterans. And it was created after the full scale invasion uh, that happened on February 24th, 2022. And it was particularly uh, created after um, many uh, stories resurfaced on social media uh, in Ukraine about uh, the treatment wounded soldiers get in medical facilities and different kind of bureaucratic institutions uh, that they had to communicate with uh, uh, to get, for example, a status of the person with a disability. So this is one of our main um, um, focuses is to um, advocate for the change in how wounded soldiers are treated in Ukraine. Um, just for the context, because I don't think, um, I think oftentimes people don't grasp, um, what is going on on the ground in Ukraine. So I will just provide you with a short context that, uh, will be important, uh, for what I will tell a little bit later. Um, currently in the Ukrainian army, there are more than 1 million people that are serving. Obviously, not all of them are fighting in, in trenches, for example, but uh, still you can imagine how many people that is. Uh, there are estimations, official state estimations, that uh, there will be at least 2 million veterans after this uh, war ends. And obviously, it depends on how long the war will be. So this is at least 2 million. Uh, the front lines um, are so-called hot front lines are uh, more than 1,200 kilometers. Uh, if you want to compare uh, your Western Front during the World War I uh, was 600, around 650 uh, kilometers. So Ukrainian front line is uh, twice as big as the Western Front during World War I. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of wounded uh, on the Ukrainian side. Uh, I'm not talking about the Russian side now. Many severely and many deal with the long term consequences. Uh, because it's an artillery war, both Russia and Ukraine heavily rely on artillery. artillery. <clears throat> uh, there are many people with post concussion syndrome. And for example, post concussion syndrome oftentimes is not even treated as a real uh, problem and people are not treated for it because there are many, many, uh, many wounds that uh, are more serious. Uh, this war, because it's an artillery war and because both sides of the war use mines heavily, uh, this is a war that leads to a lot of amputations, unfortunately. And uh, Ukrainian state was not prepared for a war of such a scale uh, that would involve so many people and uh, uh, the front, uh, such a large front line, and so on and so on. Um, and it was not uh, prepared for the effects uh, this war would have. In particular, the Ukrainian state was not prepared for the number of wounded soldiers that it would have to deal with. Um, on the one hand, Ukrainian state entered this war with a very complicated bureaucratic system that wounded soldiers uh, and civilians, partly for that matter, 
have to navigate um, after they are treated and during the treatment. And Ukrainian state uh, or Ukrainian society didn't prepare enough doctors to know how to deal with particular wounds from shells and explosions. Uh, that leads to many, many, many complications. But the main generalization I can make um, from interviewing wounded sol Ukrainian soldiers is actually that their experiences are very um, heterogeneous. That means it's very hard to generalize. Uh, different soldiers get different experiences. And this is partly connected uh, to what I said previously. So for example, many soldiers uh, talk about luck. Um, as they often say, uh, I was lucky enough uh, to get to a good doctor that knew how to treat my wound and save my, for example, leg. Um, others say I wasn't lucky enough. Uh, the same goes about hospitals, medical facilities, military units, because military units are very important in how you go through the system. They provide a lot of documents. And so much depends on the luck if you are lucky enough to get into the units that would actually do the paperwork so that you get in time to a hospital, for example, that knows how to treat your wound. Uh, many soldiers say I was lucky enough to get to a hospital or I was lucky enough that I had friends who could help me with dealing with all this paperwork because many wounded soldiers don't have, for example, time or don't have a physical possibility to, 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 to deal with the paperwork, especially if they have, for example, a uh, brain injury or things like that. Um, and this luck is often mitigated by uh, what is often referred to uh, in Ukraine and Russia, I will say it in Russian, by связи, connections, literally. So um, people who know other people who can solve the issue. So if you know a doctor or if you know someone who knows a doctor, if you know someone higher up, for example, in the military ranks who can push your unit to do the, pa the needed paperwork. Um, if you have a large network of people who can solve your problems, then you mitigate the effects of luck. So if you're not lucky enough to get into a good hospital, you can use that network, right? To, to, for you to be transferred to a hospital that knows how to treat you well, for example. And uh, so this social capital of knowing people is extremely important in Ukraine. And the other thing that people mitigate, uh, the other things that people use to mitigate uh, the luck uh, is um, cultural capital. So uh, as I said, bureaucratic system is very complicated and very hard to navigate. But if you know how to read the laws, if you know how to walk through the different kind of complicated regulations, you have an advantage. And also if you know how to fight for your rights, that also gives you an advantage. Many, many soldiers describe their experiences as um, in a way that they, they got what they were supposed to get by fighting for this thing. For example, they got the treatment or the rehabilitation because they knew where to look for the regulations then and then they had a skill to go and demand their right and both of those phenomena are class phenomena so oftentimes it correlates of who those things correlate who has a good network of friends and relatives who can solve their issue and uh, who can know how to deal with legal documents it often correlates with class, right? So people from cities, people who are well-educated, people who, before becoming soldiers, who were um, um, well off, let's say like this, they oftentimes are better off as a result 
and get a better treatment than people who don't have those skills and don't have those quote unquote connections. And this is obviously a story about inequality that is not often talked about uh, a lot these days in Ukraine, unfortunately. Um, and it's a big problem, of course. The system shouldn't work like that. The, should, the system shouldn't depend on the luck and uh, your health shouldn't depend on the luck or shouldn't depend on which people you know and which people can solve your problem informally. Right. Um, so this is how it is. <laughs> it's not a very good picture, but yeah, it is how it is. Thanks. Ivan, thank you for bringing us that really important update. And this is the first time I'm hearing about this situation for soldiers. So I'm really glad to have this um, brought to our attention. Um, so uh, now we'll uh, move to the next set of questions. And I think because we've taken quite a bit of time, I'll just ask one more round of questions for everybody and then we'll uh, respond to each other and open it up to the audience for questions. So audience uh, members, please, uh, if you come up with a question uh, as you're listening along, please feel free to enter it in the Q&A uh, button and we'll respond to it. Um, so we have... Uh, the following set of questions for you. Um, how are disability advocacy leaders, or as uh, Hannah said, simply people who have become volunteers, whether they meant to or not, um, understanding the task at hand uh, to support the various communities you're working with? Um, what is needed now? And then also, uh, what global networks or historical examples are useful in a situation like this one? And for me, as a disability studies scholar, thinking about the global context, um, this is you know important. Are there examples that we can look at in other parts of the world? Are there international networks uh, that are part of uh, how we understand what needs to happen uh, in Ukraine today? Our alliances with other regions uh, also experiencing uh, aggression or conflict um, in this way. So uh, is there anyone who'd like to take this on uh, first? I know we've uh, prepared this, or shall I just select someone? Should go in the same order again, perhaps? OK, let's do that. All right, so back to you, Hannah, uh, uh, with Fight for Right in Ukraine. Okay, thanks. Um, before um, I will start, I want to uh, thank uh, Ivan Shmatko and the team of uh, Princip. Uh, I read uh, the um, analytical report of your oral history project and it's so interesting and deeply. Thank you. Um, actually, in our organization, Fight for Right, we have direction of, of advocacy, uh, and I will talk what uh, what we are doing right now uh, in this direction. Uh, firstly, as I mentioned before in a previous uh, an, uh, answer, um, we are monitoring uh, shelters. Mm, okay, uh, it's um, it's at, like basements, shelters, uh, and also uh, temporary residents uh, for uh, IDPs in Ukraine. And I uh, took a part of the monitoring group uh, in Lviv. Uh, we um, monitored uh, temporary shelters uh, for IDPs. And um, now we are analyzing uh, the results. Uh, and firstly, the situation is really bad because uh, none of uh, the residents, shelters um, aren't um, accessible for people with disabilities, especially for uh, those who use wheelchairs. And the workers of this temporary residence facilities uh, told us uh, that they have to refuse um people in wheelchairs. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, as Magda mentioned, uh, I want to agree with uh, her that is a big problem with accessible legal, psychological, and social medical support, especially for IDPs. Um, exactly, uh, we tried. Uh, to uh, find a psychologic uh, psychologist who uh, know uh, who knows uh, sign language for um, uh, girls with uh, hearing disabilities uh, and um, actually we didn't find um, in Ukraine uh, such psychologist. Uh, and it's one of the big problem another big problem I um, Mm, I met a guy with intellectual disabilities in, in one of uh, the facility uh, and actually uh, he was out of office uh, where to get some information about uh, legal advices, especially for him in the uh, easy language. Uh, and it's another big problem because he really need assistance uh, for this and nobody support him because uh, he is alone and he rescued from occupied territory uh, alone. Um, uh, it's one big problem, how to work with IDPs and how to provide really good services, accessible services for uh, IDPs with disabilities in Ukraine. Uh, and another big issue uh, is uh, to work, uh, to finish uh, the deinstitutionalization de reform in Ukraine. Uh, the DI reform has started uh, before full-scale invasion uh, in 2017, uh, but the uh, full-scale invasion really showed us uh, how important to break institutional system in Ukraine uh, because um, uh, there were big problems with evacuation, closed institution, uh, and uh, also how to provide um, facilities facilities for them uh, in Ukraine and outside uh, of Ukraine, how to provide uh, really accessible information uh, for residents of closed institution. And uh, my colleagues from advocacy department uh, did uh, research uh, about uh, sit uh, about the situation in the closed institution near the front line in Ukraine. I will send the link to uh, to the chat, uh, and you can read the results of uh, this report. Uh, yeah, and. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, wo what I can see right now, uh, there are uh, several big NGOs in Ukraine who are really working uh, now for um, uh, for build the system uh, of the assistant living for people with intellectual disabilities in Ukraine. For example, uh, um, there are budget uh, Sertsen, uh, also Povir um, Seba or Jerelo uh, and um, a really good uh, example from um, another NGO in Lviv, Maestarnia Mrihi, it's a Dreams Workshop. Uh, they um, opened two um, assistant houses uh, in the city, uh, but uh, usually, uh, as um, I know, the parents um, uh, provide uh, these assistant houses for their children with intellectual disabilities, but uh, Maestarnia Mrihi, Dreams a workshop, uh, uh, the, uh, the residents of their houses are people from the closed institutions. The girls and boys from closed institution, uh, in institutions right uh, now um, live uh, in these houses and they want to open two more houses during um, uh, this year uh, in Lviv city. Uh, yeah. These two issues is the main uh, right now in advocacy work, as I see. Thanks. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, let's actually stay uh, here uh, and go to Ivan now, and then we'll wrap up this section with Magda. Well, I can talk only about Princip, I think. Um, Princip was designed particularly for advocacy work. 
uh, and almost everything is tailored for advocacy work. Um, and I think Princip is quite effective in that regard. Uh, my part, obviously, is uh, to conduct research that can be used for advocacy. Um, but um, I think I will say a few general things. Um, Ukrainian society is not an ideal society, but in recent years, um, it became a very vibrant society that knows um, how to push uh, authorities to change things. It's not always obviously effective, uh, but everyone who encounters Ukrainian society, who lives in Ukraine, uh, easily notices that there is a lot of energy going from bottom to up. And oftentimes, especially before the full-scale invasion, maybe it's changing, maybe it's not, the state was weak, but not in terms of um, how the weak state is generally used uh, as some kind of uh, synonym to the failed state. Obviously, it's not failed, as you could see uh, after February 24th. Um, but as a state that oftentimes cannot, it is weak in in. in in the meaning that it can, oftentimes a state that cannot force um, its population to do things. It has its uh, obviously drawbacks, uh, but oftentimes it gives a possibility for people to push for the change. Um, and there is this kind of energy in Ukrainian society still, even during the, during the full-scale invasion. So there is this... Um, understanding, I think, among people, at least in Princip and around uh, the uh, issues of the wounded soldiers, that the system can be changed and the results can be achieved. Um, so I think the future looks not as bad as one might think, but currently, obviously, the, 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 the situation is quite dire actually um as i talked um about it um at, at a few minutes previously but uh future looks relatively good in terms of changes in terms of how the ukrainian state will adapt to what is going on so i don't think i can say any more about it thanks Thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, now I'll go to Magda. Uh, again, the question is, what are disability advocate leaders uh, thinking about what is the task at hand, what is needed now, and what global networks or historical examples are useful in a situation like this one? Magda. So as Anna and Ivan already uh, mentioned, there are many uh, grassroots initiatives that are so much needed in order to address uh, the dire needs and, and challenges and problems. Uh, so, 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 the, so there is a lot um, going on on the ground, let's say, um, with grassroots organizing and uh, um, philanthropic and also ad hoc, ad hoc initiatives because the situation is changing um, and is fluid. Uh, and this is extremely important. Um, at the same time, uh, there is a lot of work um, uh, going um, in relation to trying to advocate uh, for um, more systemic uh, changes, um, especially uh, in the realm of uh, human rights uh, regime and especially humanitarian regimes. Uh, so going back to uh, what Hannah was discussing, and I was discussing also about um, evacuations um, and the humanitarian gaps um, in that regards. Um, so, for instance, to give you an example of a concrete systemic advocacy that is taking place right now, um, together with other um, advocates from, from various countries, um, uh, including our allies in the uh, from the Women Enabled International, uh, we have been advocating within the United Nations um, for the development of a, of a particular um, tool 
that is a general comment um, on the Article 11 um, of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, uh, this article pertains to uh, the situation of risk and humanitarian emergencies. Uh, and in our view, when talking about Article 11 um, of the CRPD, we should really start having uh, a much greater attention uh, towards, um, because in the context of disability and how war intersects uh, with disability, because war hits particularly hard um, on people with disabilities, as well as leads to uh, impairments among civilians, but also as even um, uh, stressed also among um, uh, soldiers. Uh, so uh, to, to give you um, a sense of how this advocacy uh, works or what kind of discourses uh, it, it's based on, I will shortly um, highlight um, some existing links um, between pre-war situation and the quality of life uh, of people with disabilities. Um, that we call paradoxes, uh, which need to be, uh, in our view, unpacked and, uh, and kept in mind uh, while further discussing as, as well as advocating as to what, why, and how uh, should be included as soon as possible in their general comment, um, ensuring that all state parties to the CRPD uh, take, and I quote, all necessary measures to ensure the protection and safety of women, girls, and gender diverse people with disabilities in this, in this context. Uh, and furthermore, using the paradoxes lens, uh, I think might help uh, us see similarities and differences across other war case studies beyond Ukraine uh, in order to enhance um, uh, global advocacy. So uh, one paradox that we had identified uh, pertains to the fact that despite, um, as disability studies professor Rosemary Gallen Thompson um, aptly um, argues, that disability is everywhere once uh, you start noticing it, um, despite that humanitarian players, um, as the Ukrainian example shows, um, tend not to recognize the significance of the world's largest minority uh, when drafting uh, their emergency and risk assessment protocols. Uh, so for instance, uh, they failed to establish connections between the need for accessible and inclusive humanitarian response, um, the human, uh, human rights values uh, that they claim to prioritize. And uh, this paradox is also fueled by the fact that for many decades, uh, the disabled people's movement has been uh, advocating within the UN regime for eradicating the, the medical model of disability. Uh, yet the humanitarian players um, have tended to uphold this model. Uh, and I would argue that this pattern was uh, enabled uh, by the broader context uh, in which humanitarian players operate. Uh, namely, most countries' legal systems and policies are still largely shaped by the medical model and the charity. Uh, induced your complex. Um, so the medical model, as we know, is detrimental to the quality of life of disabled people in peacetime, um, as it undermines the values of the CRPD, you know, across the board, uh, including not positioning people with disabilities as right holders, um, but as patients to be fixed, um, and simply as inferior human beings. And during the times of, um, you know, Worse, this model, uh, which permeates humanitarian discourse, uh, enabled, for instance, in Ukraine, uh, even further uh, mar marginaliz marginalization as it allowed uh, for placing them very low uh, within the so-called humanitarian hierarchy of human life. Uh, so one could argue that there is a link between the peacetime treatment of the lives of people with disabilities um, and the humanitarian tendency to abandon those people uh, to their fate as uh, is and was the case uh, with many Ukrainians with disabilities who, who have been trapped, uh, for instance, in medical and charity totalitarian institutions. Uh, and it has been estimated that people with disabilities who have lived with their families uh, and not in institutions had higher chances of fleeing Ukraine. 
Uh, and the second uh, paradox pertains to the oversight of humanitarian players, um, even in peacetime, uh, of the extensive human rights, accessibility, and intersectional knowledge of disabled people's organizations, including, including disabled women's organizations. That was something that Hannah mentioned um, in her uh, first response, that rarely people with disabilities are framed and valued um, as active participants um, of the civil sector, whether it is during peacetime or wartime. Um, and this is a paradox uh, because it occurs uh, despite the CRPD's emphasis on the requirement for st state parties and by extension, civil society players to closely consult disability issues uh, with organizations and initiatives uh, representing people with disabilities. Mm. So this intentional or unintentional omissions uh, can be said to maintain the status quo uh, in the activist arena, uh, meaning that vibrant disabled people's movement, including the one in Ukraine, uh, remain mostly on the fringes of the dominant human rights movements, as well as the current uh, humanitarian responses. Uh, so this gap, uh, as we already discussed, uh, had uh, and has fatal consequences um, in the times of war, uh, including the ongoing Russia's war against Ukraine. Uh, and as I mentioned already, disabled people's organizations um, lacking financial um, resources and humanitarian skills or know-how uh, still filled many of the gaps left open by a large and wealthy uh, humanitarian players. So while our um, you know, DIY evacuations um, were commandable, uh, there were also significant limitations in how effectively we could um, assist um, Ukrainian refugees uh, with disabilities. So these are uh, just um, a couple of reasons as to why um, myself and my fellow um, advocates um, think that uh, the development of the general comment on the Article 11 of the CRPD is such a timely and urgent matter. And of course, in order to, uh, you know, to do good advocacy and effective advocacy, we need um, evidence and data. That is why we keep uh, uh, doing research, um, and collecting uh, testimonies, et cetera, et cetera. So advocacy and 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 research uh, go hand in hand right now. Thank you, Magda. Uh, that's a really important point to think about how we can build power as disabled people's organizations uh, by coming together and uh, advocating for needs on the ground, but then also advocating for policy change at the level of the international humanitarian organizations. Um, so I want to offer now an opportunity for our panelists to respond to one another or share comments or additional notes uh, that came up during your comments. Um, something that you missed and really wanted to say. Uh, and I'll again encourage our participants to enter your questions for our panelists in the chat. Um, and uh, we'll turn to um, audience questions shortly. Thank you again to all of our audience members for being here live. And then if you're joining us later on the recorded version, uh, please do feel free to reach out to us if you have uh, something to share. Uh, so back to you, uh, panelists, do you have any comments uh, for one another uh, or final thoughts uh, that you maybe missed earlier? I just want to add a comment uh, to the uh, Magda um, uh, uh, last answer. It's very important, actually, I agree to uh, to collect data and doing some research, especially collect data, because um, we have really a big uh, question to the number uh, to the number of people with disabilities in Ukraine, uh, because we tried to 
to do alternative uh, collection of the numbers of people with disabilities, uh, th uh, then provided a state uh, a statistic committee of Ukraine. Uh, and now we try to do uh, one more time this research, but, but now it's very difficult because uh, a lot of people are refugees right now. And uh, we are thinking with other colleagues, sociologist co uh, colleagues, uh, how to do it correctly. Uh, because uh, we really need the, uh, this data to operate uh, some advocacy work. Thank you for this comment. This is such a fascinating issue, Hannah. Thanks for raising that because uh, in the best of circumstances, we have really major problems facing the UN and other organizations every uh, state in collecting rates of disability because self-reported data doesn't match up with health data collected by the state. Uh, household surveys turn up totally different results from uh, social security registers. Uh, so we already know that this is an ongoing issue in global uh, disability advocacy that we've been studying for 30 years how to estimate rates of disability. And it's just an ongoing issue uh, that unfortunately we can see it doesn't matter how many disabled people one disabled person left behind in an institution or in a family home is too many but unfortunately the reality of rhetorical power when we're making claims about this need is that we do need uh strong figures so thanks for bringing that up uh, magda uh yeah just a, just a quick footnote um regarding um gathering data and research and thank you hannah for this important comment that you just made um, one thing that I wanted to also stress uh, is that we've noticed, and by we, I mean um, disability studies scholars and advocates, uh, we noticed that um, scholars from uh, other disciplines, uh, for instance, migration studies, uh, can be really our great allies uh, when it comes to uh, the war situation. Um, and another paradox uh, has been that in migration studies, um, the intersection between disability and, a, and the status of migrant or a status of refugee has not been um, researched that well uh, with migration studies perspective, it has not been theorized. So um, some of us are trying to form alliances across disciplines, so for instance, uh, Currently, um, some of my fellows, my, my migration studies um, or, uh, fellow uh, researchers are joining forces with, uh, with us and we are trying to uh, research uh, and map the uh, responses of uh, disabled activists to the war, uh, Ukraine, to the Russian uh, war against Ukraine, but from a perspective um, of the uh, of the Polish activists and Romanian activists uh, to do some comparative study um, on that topic. So I'm just saying that uh, it's good to go uh, beyond our disciplinary bubbles uh, to join forces. And for instance, migration studies is one of such um, addresses, let's say. Thank you, Magda. I think we perhaps even have some of our migration studies colleagues joining us today. So it'd be great to hear from all of you uh, uh, listening uh, and watching uh, and following along uh, on that point. Um, any other comments from panelists from one of you to another or additional thoughts? Okay, we have just 13 minutes left, so I will ask a question and I see we already have one question coming in from the audience, please continue to add your questions and I'll uh, raise them. Uh, I'm just quite curious listening uh, to this um, and thinking about the historic uh, tension, at least in North America, uh, and also in Russia, where I have studied disability advocacy. Uh, between veterans advocacy movements and uh, disabled people who perhaps are living in institutions or in family homes who uh, either are born with disabilities or, or were not injured in war. So uh, obviously <clears throat> there are moments of strategic alliance when these two kind of separate uh, groups uh, come together, but uh, 
share some common experiences, for instance, when it comes to access. But uh, obviously, this is an unfolding situation on the ground and very difficult to say. But um, have has there been much conversation at this point, or could you see future alliances between uh, the veterans organization and uh, the organization? like Fight for Right that's working mostly with uh, community people with disabilities uh, who aren't necessarily veterans. Or perhaps Yvonne or Hannah, could you say, uh, listening to one another, uh, do you hear common goals or do you hear really big differences in the kinds of issues that are facing your respective research populations? Um, I will start probably. Um, I can't say much about it. Uh, as you said, it's unfolding and it's hard to predict. Me personally, I would certainly hope so, that this tragic situation would help forge alliances that would uh, help uh, people with disabilities who li have lived with disabilities before the full-scale invasion as well. Uh, I think um, the sheer number of people who unfortunately um, be started to live with disabilities uh, because of the full-scale invasion will make Ukrainian study, at least I hope so, and I think it's very much possible, will make Ukrainian society more conscious of uh, the needs of the people with disabilities. Um, and obviously Ukraine has a huge uh, problem with infrastructure, which is quite evident in interviews I'm doing right now, right, with soldiers who get wounded, uh, including hospitals and facilities that definitely one would imagine would have to be adapted, right, for, for, for the people they are treating, but that's often unfortunately not the case. This is actually changing, at least in... Um, both military and civilian hospitals, because the sheer number of wounded um, resulted uh, in, um, in, 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 in the fact that uh, actually a lot of soldiers are treated in civilian hospitals, just in case, um, because military infrastructure, just military hospitals cannot deal with, with, with the numbers. Um, so, as far as I know, in many of those hospitals, um, there are attempts to, 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 to change the situation, uh, including uh, also because there is a push once again from a grassroots push, right, to change this. So, for example, there is an in initiative that essentially fundraises money through Twitter. Uh, to 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 buy new benches to put in the corridors so that uh, wounded, for example, soldiers and other patients can sit while they are waiting to get some kind of bureaucratic paper. So even including initiatives like that, right? Buying basic things so that someone can sit and not stand while waiting for some doctor to to make a document. Uh, so there is once again a lot of grassroots initiatives involved in that and i think there are a lot of discussions right now or maybe it's my bias because i'm following those um surrounding um the the, the need to change um but uh, obviously i can't predict but i certainly hope that alliances would form and um Ukrainian society in general would uh, be more conscious of of the needs of people with disabilities because uh, I'm not a scholar, uh, disability scholar, but I think it's quite fair to say that um, uh, Ukrainian society was not very much accommodating for uh, before the full scale region for people with disability. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. Hannah, do you want to add something, please? Yeah, thanks. Uh, actually, it's a big question. Uh, and um, what I want to say firstly, 
uh, one uh, what I see now in the media uh, and uh, also among uh, Ukrainian society, um, uh, a lot of uh, information now about uh, soldiers who um, um, got disabilities after uh, during the war and uh, uh, really less information about the civilians with disabilities. Uh, and uh, I understand why uh, is, uh, uh, is it right now, uh, but um, is it really change the consciousness of Ukrainian society? Because now I see really as a charitable model of disability in the media discourse and society narratives um, about disability um, and uh, also kind of rehabilitation principles of disability too and it's really okay uh, when we talk about the processes after uh, after the uh, after uh, the uh, uh, wandering uh, but it's a question how it changed the, uh, the rights of people with disabilities. Uh, is it uh, just a first step uh, uh, on the way to the human rights model uh, or we stay in this charitable and, um, uh, and rehabilitation uh, model of disability? Uh, it's the first question for me, uh, and also uh, I want to agree with Ivan that the grassroots organizations tried to provide some information about a disability, how to uh, react to people with disabilities, especially who use uh, uh, prosthesis. Uh, or um, or have uh, uh, empathies, uh, and they provide really good information. Uh, not to be very charitable to them, you can uh, stay and uh, ask something uh, to people. Uh, but um, but also it's more about soldiers. Uh, and really, really not a lot of information uh, how to communicate uh, and provide support for uh, civilians with disabilities who born with disabilities, etc. And also my colleagues um, did a focus group discussion uh, with uh, uh, with just Ukrainians uh, without uh, disabilities about their perception uh, about this disability uh, and you know mostly of them really talk uh, in uh, um, uh, throughout narrative charitable narratives they need to help supporting uh, maybe money uh, etc uh, but it's maybe it's <laughs> really not bad because we uh, did the same focus group before full scale invasion uh, and uh, the result of um, that focus group was really terrible because people talk uh, more about segregation uh, that they afraid people with disabilities they want uh, that people with disabilities would be close uh, would be close in their apartments or special institution and now uh, it's changing but not changing to human rights model that i want to be <laughs> thank you uh Thank you very much for those responses. Uh, unfortunately, Yvonne had to uh, step off er a few minutes early, uh, but we have uh, just uh, three more minutes and we do have a really interesting question from our audience, uh, from Armina Babakian, uh, who's wondering about collecting data during conflict or crisis, uh, writing, besides interviewing, what other methods do you recommend to collect data during conflict or crisis? Um, so we mentioned earlier uh, about this. Uh, so maybe we can respond to that. And I also just want to note that we have some uh, thanks coming in uh, from other uh, um, pan uh, audience members. Jessica Robbins Panko says, thank you from Wayne State University in Detroit. And uh, Zuzana Kuvevska Sobolevska writes, uh, thank you so much for an incredibly interesting webinar. I'm a Polish PhD student from Warsaw. I volunteered as a communicational aide 
and translator for deaf and hard of hearing Ukrainians. During my time volunteering, I saw different Polish organizations created by people with disabilities focusing on aiding Ukrainians with similar disabilities. I also know about one Polish Ukrainian organization created after the war started by mothers of children with disabilities for mothers in similar circumstances. I wanted to ask about this kind of alliance. Are they still active? Or maybe what I saw was a small movement that wasn't vi visible in your wider studies. Okay, so two questions in just the last couple minutes. Um, one about how to do this research uh, methodologically and the other about are these sort of ad hoc organizations that Magda mentioned earlier receiving uh, refugees uh, evacuating from Ukraine still active? What has happened to these networks? Uh, Magda. Let me respond first to the uh, shortly to the, uh, the first question, and I'm sure Hannah can can add. I'm just um, I'm just aware that uh, the type of research uh, uh, that um, um, is being asked about that is collecting data during, um, you know, war or conflict. This is a highly, also a highly ethical issue. Um, so I'm sure there is, there are, and there should be no like ready-made recipes as to how uh, we approach gathering data and um, uh, documentation. But um, uh, if you're interested in, in discussing this issue with, uh, with a with a specialist, I can highly recommend, for instance, um, uh, sociologist Dr. Lydia Kuzemska, uh, who is currently a fellow at the Forum of uh, Trans uh, Regional Studies in Berlin, and uh, she really is an ex expert also in um, in methods uh, that you're asking about. She's really experienced in uh, gathering data uh, when it comes to the topics of internal displacement, forced migration borders uh, during conflicts and wars. So for instance, that is one of the uh, one of the experts that I can recommend you know uh, following up uh, with about exact um, uh, maybe tips or um, further recommendation or literature that you could look into. And when it comes to the second question, thank you Susanna for um, attending this panel and also for for your question. Um, the situation is fluid uh, because um, not only the situation in Ukraine is changing, but also the situation in Poland, uh, as we know, is very unstable and has been unstable. Um, so when it comes to the third sector uh, networks, um, they some of some of them tended to dissolve um, due to the fact that uh, some of uh, some of, some of the refugees decided to go back. To Ukraine, or some of them decided to go further uh, west uh, to Europe. However, um, there is a lot of a lot of interesting activist um, initiatives uh, still going on and unfolding, uh, especially especially around uh, feminist and human rights um, networks. Um, so for instance, you could take a look at uh, FemFund, uh, Fondus Feministyczny. Uh, they have been supporting um, a lot of networks that you are asking about, and uh, perhaps uh, some of them will develop into uh, larger organizations. But I also think that the uh, uh, the results of the election might have actually a positive impact on what will be happening in the uh, upcoming months. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks so much. We're right at time, but maybe we have a moment to go to Hannah for one last comment. If you want to make a closing remark, Hannah, and then we will wrap up the panel. Thank you. I Thank you for the question. It's a really little remark to the first question about methodology. Um, maybe the first thing what you can do to ask you a question was the main goal of your research uh, and run um, to methodology after this. Um, actually, this question I discussed with my colleagues, Sarah Phillips, uh, Julie Hammond, and Vodhavar Blowich uh, when we um, 
uh, really work to uh, the article um, about actual methodology and ethical uh, of research, disability research during the war. Uh, and also, um, I can share my experiences. Firstly, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I uh, prepared uh, like a diary uh, of my obs uh, volunteering uh, observation. Uh, also, um, I try to uh, to do a media analysis of the Facebook groups uh, of different uh, OPDs uh, in Ukraine. Uh, I try uh, to do uh, also visual analysis of photos which provided uh, in this uh, Facebook groups uh, and um, also as I know my colleagues try to uh, analyze uh, telegram uh, channels uh, and uh, groups such, uh, of uh, chatting uh, ch chatting uh, of people with this Disabilities in uh, uh, in really big groups. Uh, what a question uh, they rise uh, uh, there. Uh, and uh, but when we start interviewing, it's really a big question. How to do it uh, ethically, correctly, and how we uh, can uh, share the information uh, that uh, provide our narrators. Um, it's uh, really a big question for another discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I want to uh, now wrap up our panel. So I want to thank everyone for being here and for joining us today. I want to thank our panelists uh, for being here. Um, this is such an important issue and we have so much work to do and I want to offer the most support to the researchers who are doing this work and the advocates and volunteers and organizers uh, on the ground. Um, so uh, please let's continue this conversation. Uh, thanks to the University of Toronto and the University of Toronto Scarborough for funding our research center, the Center for Global Disability Studies, and thanks to the Monk School for funding the prolific serious events series and making this event today uh, technically possible. Uh, to all of these units for funding the language access uh, for today's events. And thanks, of course, to our access workers and translators and interpreters, uh, to the panelists, to our support staff. And thanks very much to our audience members for taking the time to be here today. Uh, those who I know and do not know and those joining us in the future on the recording. Um, I really appreciate you for joining us for this panel and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you.